Well, good afternoon. I know you all met Bo last week from our team, who is our, our campaign's director, and he showed you the line, which I think is a very powerful documentary of actual people's stories. Did you find it helpful? It's knowing people's stories, I think, that really changes our, our politics, if you will, on all of this. So he had a great time with you all, and uh, I heard there was good conversation. We had our conference here at Georgetown on Tuesday and Wednesday on the New Social Covenant, and some of you were there for part of that meeting on uh, Wednesday. Uh, I had high expectations for that, but it went even better than I thought. So I'm really pleased that uh, it went on, and I hope those of you that weren't there can I think it's going to be on video soon, Jacob, parts yeah, of that. I, I think that's the case. So we will we'll get you we'll get you a word on that. Well, what a week to talk about poverty. Two days after you saw the faces of poverty in the film on the line, um, the House of Representatives voted to cut almost forty billion dollars from SNAP on those food stamps. So the Census Bureau says that last year, food stamps kept 4 million people from falling into poverty last year, just this past year. So if those cuts were to pass, that would plunge those people into poverty and 3 million more every year for the next decade. So a pastor once said to me, I'm worried about dependence, dependency. So what do you mean? Well, like those food stamp things. I said, really? I said, did you know that 72% of the people getting food stamps come from working families where one person's working full time and kids? Did you know that? And did you know they're only on food stamps for about nine months, ten months, to get them over a tough spot? Did you know that? No, didn't know that. You should get that out. <laughs> you should get that out. So I had two interviews this morning on SNAP, two radio interviews at 6 and 7. And uh, it's interesting how the facts and faces, that's how I would put it, the facts of poverty and the faces are really unknown to an awful lot of people. They don't know the facts, and they don't know the faces. Um, there also was a good bit of, I would call it, hypocrisy in the voting. There was a representative, I'll call him out, named Stephen Finch, Fincher from, Stephen Fincher from uh, Tennessee, who received 3.5 million dollars in farm subsidies to his farm in the last three years, 3.5 million dollars. And yet he led the fight, helped lead the fight to cut food stamps to people who were poor. Um, and he used the verse from Thessalonians, those who don't work shouldn't eat. So farm subsidies are fine but um, food stamps aren't. So I did a piece last week on HuffPost um, called Picking on the Poor. <laughs> now, I think that cutting deficits in the long term, that's a necessary thing. I think cutting massive deficits is a moral issue and moral cause. I got two kids, don't want them strapped with uh, the shackles of debt for the rest of their lives. But how you do it is also a moral question. So there are three pharmaceutical lobbyists for every member of Congress, three, one industry. There are many lobbyists on K Street for working class moms and their kids who are on food stamps. So what they're doing is they're not going to where the money is. If you were a real fiscal hawk and you wanted to be responsible fiscally, you'd, you'd go to where the money was, I would think, like farm subsidies or Pentagon spending or oil subsidies or all kinds of things, tax breaks on your second or third home if you have one. 
But you go to where it's safe to go. It's safe, they think, to go after people who don't donate to campaigns, who don't vote often, and who are vulnerable. So their logic is very different from, I would say, uh, uh, religious logic. And this morning I was on, one show was a, you know, a very secular, big nationwide radio drive-in show. The other was a religious show, a Christian radio show. And I knew I'd get the most trouble on that one. <laughs> so I started with where I want to start to today. Um, I want to start this, this lecture on poverty, uh, not just with food stamps and how bad things are, but what the framework is for those who call themselves people of faith. Um, it's the text that was my own, if I can share a personal story, my own conversion text that brought me out of the student movement and back to my own faith. It's from Matthew 25, and it simply says, as most of you know, I was hungry, and you gave me nothing to eat. It's very simple. I was hungry, and you gave me nothing to eat. All the people said, Lord, when do we see you hungry? or thirsty, or naked, or sick, or a stranger. And he says, as you've done it to one of the least of these, you've done it to me. Now that context suggests that um, if we haven't fed hungry people, what Jesus is saying really in that text, which you haven't done to them, you haven't done to me. Now, the quick response from that, from some in politics, is, well, that meant the church, not government. So if you would like to, uh, there's a whole chapter in the new book about the role of government, what Romans 13 says, what the prophets say. Again and again, government is supposed to protect, protect the people from harm, danger, evil, violence, and promote, promote uh, the common good. And in particular, the scriptures say, princes, rulers, kings, and not just those in Israel, but outside in neighboring countries, will be judged by how they protect the poor. That's what the scriptures say. And that's very clear uh, in all of the scriptures that talk about government and princes and kings and rulers. So, um, uh, in Luke 4, where Jesus did his opening riff, his first gig, his mission statement, I call it, his Nazareth Manifesto, he says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. That's what the text says. This is his, this is his first, first appearance, his opening statement. So he defines his mission, good news to the poor. So I would just say from the text again, Whatever else one thinks the gospel might be, if it helps to cure your addictions, wonderful. If it helps to put your life back together, wonderful. Helps to straighten out your marriage and your relationships, all of that is well and good. But if the gospel that we preach is not good news to the poor, it's simply, by the text, not the gospel of Jesus. Very simply. Now, Judaism says much the same. It's the prophets say, you've got to judge things by how, it, things, how you treat the other. That's often the language, the other in Judaism. Or the Hebrew prophets say, a nation, a king, a ruler is judged not by its gross national product or its military firepower or its popular culture being the envy of the world. It's judged by, it says in the text, how we treat the poorest and most vulnerable. That is the reverse logic of this town. This town, everything is about how we treat the powerful and the wealthy. It's a totally reversal of that logic to say the test, the metric, the judge, judgment ought to be is how are the least among you doing? <laughs> how are the poor and vulnerable doing? That's just a reverse logic from all that we're used to. Um, when I was in seminary, uh, some time ago, we, our first year, uh, and this might have been in one of your, uh, chapters, um, we took an old Bible 
And uh, we were very uh, zealous about this cause, so we took a pair of scissors and cut out of the Bible every single reference, like the ones I just read, to, to the poor. All the verses about the poor, poverty, God comforting the afflicted, social justice, all that. We just cut out all the verses. Old Bible, pair of scissors. Took a long time, a long, long time. When we were done, we had this old Bible and still have it to today. And, um, but it was a Bible that was literally full of holes. I mean, it was in shreds. It was in pieces. It was falling apart in my hand. And I would take it out to preach with me, and I would say, brothers and sisters, this is the American Bible. It's full of holes from all we've paid no attention to, ignored, denied, we might as well each take our pair of scissors and start cutting it out. It's all on the cutting room floor. A couple years ago, I got this Bible in the mail. It's called the Poverty and Justice Bible. <laughs> this was done by the British Bible Society, where I just was for a couple weeks in September, and World Vision. And what they've done, they, they refer to that story from those seminary days, and they've taken all the verses about the poor that were on the cutting room floor, and they put them back in this Bible in World Vision Orange. All the way through. It's a lot because we discovered that um, it's the second most prominent theme in the Hebrew Scriptures, number two. Idolatry is number one, this was two. It occurs one every one out of every 16 verses in the New Testament is about the poor. In the Synoptic Gospels, one of every 10 verses. In Luke's Gospel, one of every seven. I didn't name my son Luke after Luke Skywalker. <laughs> so this Bible became very uh, important to me, very symbolic to me, uh, not just because the verses got put back, but this Bible, I think, represents the priorities of a new generation of people. I, in, uh, in England, here, when I go out on the road, half the audiences are under 30. They're millennials or younger. And I think, and I got this from your reflections too, a lot of you talked about we need a movement. We need to build a movement here around this. Bo said last week you were asking, what can I do? What, what is it that we can do? I think a new generation is going to put our Bibles back together again. Say it again. I think a new generation could put these scriptures back together again. Uh, and today, I want to talk about what we're facing, but also how it might be that we could change that. So the poverty rate in this country now is higher than any time in 50 years. 15%, almost 50 million people. For kids, it's 22%, one out of every five kids in this country is poor, one of every five children. Uh, and people are struggling in the middle class. So on the phone this morning, there was this guy called from Ohio, and he was just mad. I'm working really hard, and my taxpayer dollars are going for these people who don't want to work, and they're lazy, and they're shiftless, and they don't care. And he didn't have his facts right, and, and he didn't really know any of those people. But he was angry because why? Because he's insecure. He's in trouble, too. He's working hard, and he's middle-class wages are stagnating. And so the recovery, since the recovery, if you saw the stats in the last two weeks, the fifth year, five-year anniversary, inequality is now greater than it was before the recession. It was already higher than at any time since the Great Depression before the recession, now it's even higher. And 1% of 
of the population has received 95% of the recovery, the income from the recovery. 1%, many who think the 1% were the ones who helped to start this in the first place, they are the only ones who have recovered so far from the recession. So people are angry, they're upset. At our meeting last week, it was pointed out that inequality by itself isn't the only issue. It's when people feel like the system is rigged, things are unfair. The Wall Street Journal reports that three quarters of the American people think the system is biased toward those who are rich. So back to food stamps, uh, you know, sometimes people criticize people like me who they say they're for redistribution, and I am, but there is, the R word's already going on they are redistributing wealth and have been now for several decades from the poor middle class to the top. Uh, as you saw in your readings, uh, the period after World War II that I, uh, you know, was, uh, was a kid growing up in that period in Detroit, uh, there was prosperity for most people. And the term, the rising tide lifts all boats was really true. And the bottom 20% was doing really well. It, it just was rising. I remember my dad came home from World War II, and we all had a, a little three-bedroom house in little neighborhoods of three-bedroom houses. <laughs> and uh, I went to school, and uh, everybody had a job, or their dad did, or their, and they wanted a job at GM or Fort Chrysler. They could have one, too. It was a social contract. There was a union. There were benefits. There was a future for your kids. And during that period, there was prosperity and it was rising for all. But from 1980 forward, it has been skewed. There's been more and more prosperity, but it has been skewed almost entirely toward the top. Middle class has gone down and the poverty rate is higher than ever before. And that inequality uh, has grown. And as um, we say in this new social covenant we talked about last week, uh, there's a great book out called Spirit Levels in Britain showing how inequality really diminishes the quality of life for everyone, finally. Ownership, belonging, social problems, crime, delinquency, prisons, all of the rest makes things worse for everyone when inequality gets too great. So because of talent and work ethics and innovation, creativity, hard work, and good luck, there will always be inequality. There always will be some human inequality. But when that level gets too, too massive, things begin to fall apart. And that's where we are right now. Um, and then you go global. <laughs> so, global. Every three seconds. A child dies because of totally preventable illness or avoidable hunger every three seconds. And when my kids learned that fact, they just couldn't get over it. It was part of our prayers at night. They couldn't get over that fact of how every day, day in, day out, this happens again and again and again. So here's Bono speaking at the National Prayer Breakfast a few years ago. When churches start demonstrating on debt, governments listened and acted. When churches start organizing, petitioning, and even that most unholy of acts today, God forbid, lobbying on AIDS and global health, governments listened and acted. I'm here today in all humility to say you changed minds, you changed policy, you changed the world, so thank you. Check Judaism, says Bono. Check Islam, check pretty much anyone. I mean, God may be with us in our mansions on the hill. I hope so. He may, may well be with us in all manner of controversial stuff. Maybe, maybe not. But the one thing we can all agree, all face, is that God is with the poor and vulnerable, says the star of U2. God is in the slums, 
in the cardboard boxes with a poor playhouse. God is in the silence of a mother who has infected her child with a virus that will end both of their lives. God is in the cries heard under the rubble of war. God is in the debris of wasted opportunity and lives. God is with us if we are with them. After that talk, I, I said to Bono, that's the most religious I've heard you be so far. He said, well, I kind of got carried away. <laughs> what happened to Bono is he was, years before, in this refugee camp in Ethiopia. He was kind of, you know, a, a rock star who was doing lyrics about good stuff, and like a lot of them, and he went to do a visit, you know. I mean, all the celebs do that. They make visits, and football players, and ballet dancers and movie stars but he's out there seeing the poor and and this um and this man comes up to him and hands bono his child baby child and you know photo op we've all done that and but then he tries to give the child back to the man and the man with tears in his eyes said no please would you take him would you take my boy because he'll die here he has no chance to live here. He's going to die unless you take him. Now, as a dad with two boys, I can imagine what it must have felt like for that father to say to Bono, please take my son or he'll die. Bono couldn't take the kid because of all kind of stuff, but he says that boy has traveled with him the rest of his life. He's always thinking about that boy. What this tells us is something about about relationships, which we somehow have lacked. Um, poverty goes on like this because we tolerate it. We tolerate it. We know about it. We're stunned, shocked by the figures, numbers. But finally, we tolerate it. And it goes on and on. Jim Kim, who you read from the World Bank, has what he thinks is a plan to end extreme poverty by 2030. He has worked this out with business people and NGOs and CEOs, and he's, he's really excited about this. And he called me over a meeting this summer in July, and he told me about the plan. First floor of the World Bank now, first time ever they have this visual, what can we do, what can you do to end extreme poverty? It says in the World Bank, first, first floor. Never had that before. And I was impressed, and he said, here's the plan. But he said, um, but we can't do it at the World Bank. We don't have the moral authority. We don't have the constituency. We can't do this by ourselves. But you do. The faith community has moral authority, and you have constituency. So I'm proposing a formal partnership, alliance between the World Bank and the faith community to end extreme poverty by 2030. And by the way, Ban Ki-moon, who says he's talked to you as well, he wants to join this. So here's Jim Kim, World Bank, Ban Ki-moon saying, they want a partnership. I said, how about covenant? They said, yeah, we like that. Covenant with the faith community. Because they don't have the moral authority to change the political will, to change the toleration. So we're working on, well, I don't know what that's going to mean, but it's a very exciting possibility. But it's only going to work if we can mobilize a new generation. Some of you mentioned Muhammad Yunus. Uh, you read him, heard, heard about him. He's a wonderful guy. And one time we were on a panel together at Davos, and um, he was talking about his, you heard, his social business, what I call purposeful business. People who want to be in business, not just to make pro profit, but to make a difference. They want to use business skills, their talents, to solve problems. I was on the phone today with uh, one of the leading people in that field where he says business people have to be engaged in, in, in creating value and values and solving things that we need to solve. So Muhammad Yunus is dealing with all these CEOs, and we had them, we had them, they were with us. And he talked about not just philanthropy, not just give us money. He said, we're using business, so he's making payroll. And they were drawn to that. He was 
running a business. He was making profits. He was succeeding. And he had all the CEOs eating out of his hand. Tilly said, Tilly said, then we take our profits and pour them back into the, into the new business to solve the new problem so we don't have executive compensation like you're used to. Whoop, lunchtime, lunchtime. Conversation quickly died. What are the obstacles we well, gotta figure out? The obstacles to building that kind of movement. They often say, and also what are the themes that'll work? They often say, you've heard, if you give a man a fish, that's good. But if you teach a man the fish, that's better. You've heard that, right? Well, you know, uh, here's a better plan. First of all, do it with a, with a woman and not a man. Because as you saw in Half the Sky, all the data shows that while women and, uh, while women and girls are often the primary victims of poverty and conflict, they are all over the world, they also now are the primary problem solvers. They are the ones who find the solutions, women and girls, all around the world. And so I would say, don't just give men a fish or teach men a fish. Help a woman learn how to own the pond. A woman owns the pond when she learns how to be an innovator, um, a designer, a, a job creator. And that's happening now all over the world. We did a conference around this table here at Georgetown last year. And I heard people who were talking about putting electricity in to African villages so women wouldn't have to deliver their babies at night in the dark and kids could do their homework all through solar power. It's a lot cheaper. They're not going to ever put electric lines in all this place in Africa. And it's changing those countries and women are at the forefront of doing that work. Read Half the Sky. Uh, read, read the whole book if you can. It's about how women and girls are going to be key to this movement that we have to build. It means connecting uh, our values around the globe. Um, uh, I was at a conference on the Congo here in DC at the press club, CEOs, NGOs, and as you probably know, the Congo has these minerals which are needed for our cell phones, right? Minerals that we need for our cell phones. And the minerals profits from them are going to warlords who are buying weapons and pillaging whole populations, particularly women and children. So here's a group at the press club. What can we do to stop the dirty minerals? That was the language. So I was the lunchtime speaker, which meant I was there to inspire them over their bad sandwiches. And I said, okay, first of all, uh, take out your cell phones. And they all did. I said, no, come on, all of you, take them out, hold them up. And they did, begrudgingly. And I said, this is now, think about this, this is now your significant other. You spend more time with this thing than anything or anyone probably in your life. This thing, all day long, is who you spend time with. Then I read, read them the parable of the Good Samaritan, which is a secular group, but they all knew the story. Uh, Jesus gets asked by a lawyer, um, who is my neighbor? Now, what you don't know in the story is this was a Washington lawyer who asked him the question, because I know that tone of voice. <laughs> it wasn't, who is my neighbor? How can I help? It was, okay, just who is my neighbor? Who am I responsible for? This is a Washington lawyer, right? Jesus says, well, here's the story. This is man beaten, robbed, laying on the side of the road, and the religious leaders pass him by. And the one who stops to help is from a different race, different ethnic group, different region, a Samaritan. And he helps at risk to himself and expense to himself, helps a stranger on the road. Jesus says, go and do that. That's what I want you to do. That's what it means to, to um, love your neighbor. So I said, anybody who helps make your cell phone Anybody whose life is impacted by your cell phone, globally now, those people, that person, those people are our neighbors. They're our neighbors. So what does it mean to turn supply chains into value chains? Supply chains into value chains. When I was out on my book tour this spring, in the middle of that time, a factory in Bangladesh collapsed. You remember that story? 
thousand people killed, they're making our clothes. Are those people our neighbors or are they not? And if they are, what does it mean to take, we started with last week or two weeks ago, love your neighbor as yourself. What does it mean to apply it to them in terms of supply chains? So there are businesses now who are open to that question. We're having conversations. How do we turn their supply chains into value chains? Um, my sons, they're 15 and 10, and they, uh, uh, they care about these things. And sometimes I dream about my kids taking their kids to the poverty museum where people could learn about, really? You had, you, had, you, had, you, you had 50 million people in the United States who were food insecure, meaning they didn't know where the next meal was coming from? You, you had that and you cut their food? Really, 25,000 people were dying, kids, people every day? Really? This is an amazing museum. I, I, I can't believe that, you, that this stuff was accepted, a poverty museum. It is literally possible now, if you've been reading the stuff from this week, it is possible business-wise, logistically, economically, it is possible to dramatically reduce poverty, as Jim Kim wants, in a couple decades. That is not impossible. It isn't rocket science. It isn't too complicated to fathom how we do it. What is lacking is public will political will. They picked on poor people last week because they're a safe target. They're a safe target. You heard about circular protection last week. We're in the office of a senior senator whose name you know, and uh, I said to the senator who I like, he's becoming a friend, I said, Senator, you and I know who are the 12 senators, Republican, Democrat, who could together find a path to fiscal responsibility, right? We know who they would be. He says, yeah, we know. And they could do so, find a path, which they're, they're going to shut down the government about and debts and all that in the next few weeks. They could find a path to do this in a way that would protect our principle, protect the poor and vulnerable. They could do that too, couldn't they? He says, yeah, they could. But then what happens is all the interests come into that conference room, that very conference room, as they always do, don't they, Senator? And they would demand their expenditures come first. And what happens is the poor would be compromised again, wouldn't they, Senator? He says, yep, that's what's going to happen. Until people who politicians listen to middle-class people, churches, synagogues, mosques, people they have to pay attention to until they say, we're going to make it politically unsafe for you to go after poor people. You think it's safe? We're going to make it unsafe for you. So we, we said to our constituency last week, uh, pay attention, count the votes on food stamps, pay attention. Find out how your representatives voting and we'll publish them all tomorrow, which we did. We got lots of thanks from people. We're going to watch now. Mr. Fincher, Stephen Fincher, we've done an action alert about Mr. Fincher. And Mr. Fincher has gotten my personal attention because he used Thessalonians to justify taking food away from poor people. So we're going to make sure that that is an issue in Mr. Fincher's re-election campaign in Tennessee. The pastors will know that. And they're going to talk to him next week before they do their op-eds in the Tennessee papers about what he did in the Congress because he thought it was safe to do this. It's going to be unsafe for Stephen Fincher in Tennessee because of the faith community. So until we start taking responsibility, it probably won't happen. Here are the obstacles to overcoming poverty. One is the poor are not a priority. <laughs> Clout and all that, as we've just said. Two, we're trapped in the liberal conservative debate about poverty. I wrote about that. You read that. I won't go into the details, but it is a foolish choice to say, as the liberals and conservatives say, 
that it's policy, it's all policy on the liberal side, or it's all culture on the conservative side. Um, uh, I, I, some of us who work and live with poor people uh, are astounded by this argument, left and right, as if you can solve it all by government policy or all by just culture. Um, the conservatives say uh, uh, that marriage is a poverty issue. And marriage is an anti-poverty measure, and they're right. Do you know how many people, what percentage of people below the poverty line are married? Did you guess? Percentage of people below the poverty line who are married? 7%. So if you are married, it's true, you are less likely to be in poverty. So on the conservative side, sometimes it sounds like they're saying, so let's set up dating services in inner city neighborhoods, right? Why is marriage failing in those places? How about the massive incarceration of black and brown men? How about jobs that don't pay a living family wage? How about education that doesn't really work for inner city kids? There are reasons why marriage isn't working, but to be for marriage is a good thing to be for if you wanna fight poverty. Three things that are critical for ending poverty. Work, work. I am, I am, last week was defending the safety net, food stamps all week long. But food stamps are not the answer to poverty. Food stamps are just a temporary measure to help people survive and get through a bad time. Work that pays living family wages is necessary to overcome poverty. Family, it is clearly true, the data all shows, that having strong two-parent families is the best way to overcome poverty. That is really true, one of the best ways. Three, ed education, education. Uh, when you got kids graduating from DC schools, high schools who can't read, which happens, uh, they're not gonna have the opportunities to help them get the jobs that help make marriage and family possible. So those three things, work, family, and education are critical and that overcomes this liberal, conservative, left-right divide. We can talk more about that in the discussion time. But three, and this may be the biggest one, the lack of relationship. <laughs> we live in bubbles in this country. We are structured to live apart from each other. We are, it's, it's designed that way. Uh, I said, I think I might have said last week, if I didn't, I'll say it now. I've learned most about the world from being in places where I was not supposed to be and being with people I was never supposed to meet. That changed my whole view of the world. What is, what is the most famous text in the Bible about poor people, do you think? I ask this question sometimes of classes or audiences of people. What's the most famous text in the Bible about poor, poor people? Any, anyone, guess. Famous text. I wish that was the most famous, but that's a great one. What else? That wins almost every quiz. <laughs> yes. The poor you will always have with you. First of all, it's a very minor text about the poor. Second, it's in Mark 14, 7. Uh, Jesus is in Bethany at the home of Simon the leper, not the head of the chamber of commerce, Simon the leper. And uh, a woman wants to worship him, so she comes in, she's poor, and she has this expensive oil, she wants to worship him and wash his feet. And the disciples complain, good liberal Democrats, you're wasting money. And, and, and he, he says, what he says there in the text is, you will always be with the poor. That's what the language actually means. You will be always with the poor. It goes back to Deuteronomy where it says, be among the poor with outstretched hands. Why? Because you're my disciples. Look where we are tonight. Simon the leper's house. Look who hangs out with us. Look who, look who some of you were. Look who our disciples are. Look who's drawn to us. You will always be with the poor. Therefore, don't be so 
politically correct. Don't deny this woman her, her, her act of worship because tomorrow, the next day, you'll always be with the poor. He assumed his followers would always have proximity with the poor because of what he taught, because of what he said, the stuff we started with at the beginning of this class. When his disciples are no longer with the poor, they get the text wrong. And they interpret the text to mean, oh, there's nothing we can do about poverty. The poor, you will always live with you. It's a wonderful favorite text for affluent countries to have. It's a great text. It says there's nothing you can do about poverty. Problem is, that's not what the text says. So we literally get the text wrong in trying to justify our lack of relationship. My experience is, and we'll talk about this in our, in our discussion, you can tell me if it's yours, uh, JVC, Jesuit Voluntary Service Corps. The motto is ruined for life. I love their motto. Ruined for life. Spend a year in a clinic, women's shelter, feeding the hungry, sheltering homeless people. Those relationships, that experience will change your life forever. It'll, it'll ruin your perspective. It'll give you a different perspective. You'll be then a different kind of teacher, nurse, doctor, lawyer, whatever you're going to do. You'll be different from that experience. That's the whole point of it. Um, I don't think as much as we're recommending books and readings, which I write and, uh, and hope are helpful, uh, our experiences will change us more than what we read. What we see, touch, taste, and smell will change us more than just what we read. We believe often at our educational institutes that we, that we think our way into new ways of living. The truth is, we live our way into new ways of thinking. That's how education really happens. We live our way into new ways of thinking. Change your location, and it'll change your perspective. So these, 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 um, these obstacles, though, are, are really overcome when we move back into relationship with people who are among the poor and vulnerable, when our metrics change, our priorities change, and we change our, um, uh, our posture. For example, when we have church leaders who say, as the one on the front cover of Sojourners this month says, the measure of the greatness of society is found in the way it treats those most in need, those who have nothing apart from their poverty, says the Pope. We pray for a heart which will embrace Im immigrants. God will judge us on how we treat the most needy. And listen to this. The culture of comfort, which makes us think only of ourselves, makes us insensitive to the cries of other people, makes us live in soap bubbles, which, however lovely, are insubstantial. They offer a fleeting and empty illusion, which results in indifference to others. Indeed, it even leads to the globalization of indifference, the globalization of indifference. In this globalized world, we have fallen into globalized indifference. We have become used to, used to the suffering of others. It doesn't affect me. It doesn't concern me. It's none of my business. The issues are structural, strategic. We have to figure out how to involve business, labor, government, all that. We can talk about all that. Finally, though, it's a matter of, uh, as the Pope says, it's a matter of our relationships. It's a matter of our friendships. It's a matter, for those of us who are people of faith, it's a matter of our faith. So I think it is possible for me to imagine or dream that someday my kids are going to take their kids into that poverty museum, but only if your generation decides that number one, you're not indifferent to this any longer. Number two, even deeper, you won't tolerate it any longer. And three, you're willing to do the work, the campaigns, 
on the strategy, find the way to make things change, because, in fact, this is something who, as people of faith, we shouldn't really allow to happen anymore. And the longer we just debate budgets and food stamps and all the rest, and then forget the debate the next week, uh, we're going to continue to have this debate for a long time. But a movement of people, young people growing up outside of politics is what indeed could change and make a difference. So last night I had dinner with two people, one of my staff and, and his wife. Here they're young, they're late, they're 27, 28, I think. We talked about her work on trafficking. <laughs> She's spending her whole life trying to stop trafficking, you know. There are more uh, bonded and sexual slaves now than there were when we abolished slavery 20 years ago, more now than then. And um, when um, Charles Finney and John Wesley preached their revivals, they had altar calls, folks came forward and they gave their lives uh, to God. And on that very night, they were enlisted that very night for the anti-slavery campaign. That very night, they were enlisted. And so enlisting people who come to faith in this cause is really in our long-standing tradition. So I'd love to talk to you about what that means for a new movement of millennials, taking that, that on, and, and, and others as well, taking that, that on. Okay? All right. Open it up for a few minutes. We'll take, take a break and come back to the readings, questions, comments from last week or this week to what you heard uh, today or last Tuesday. Questions, comments. Uh, so last week we had a fairly riveting conversation about uh, the role of government somewhat, right. uh, although that's kind of a dangerous path to go down. But um, we talk a lot about poverty, but we've been focusing almost exclusively on SNAP and uh, you know the federal government's role. And I'm just curious your thoughts on that. Uh, and also the role religious uh, religious institutions play and other uh, not-for-profit organizations. And for your context as well, it was a, a conversation that was very much sparked by the, the movie as well mm -hmm. uh, and the role um, a lot of local organizations were playing in the stories we saw. Mm -hmm. um, when you look at the vote on SNAP, it was actually pretty close in the end. And most of the Republicans who voted not to cut the food stamps were targeted by the circle of protection. There are people that we talk with, and they, but there are Republicans I talked to who, for reasons of faith, decided not to vote against food stamps. But they were fearful of having even meetings in their office for other Republicans who might vote against food food stamps. The fear was very palpable. Um, I don't think was the Senate's not going to uphold cuts this substantial, and the White House hopefully won't either. But um, uh, it's the conversation that bothers me so much on the Hill, where, uh, um, put it th this way, um, you heard the story about the Republican uh, Portman in Ohio who, who discovered his son was, was gay and changed his view on, on gay rights, gay civil rights. Uh, how would these votes change for a senator whose son was poor, right? Well, there's no, there's a Congress there's a who have sons or daughters who are poor. So that lack of proximity is critical here. So I think government is the last place a movement comes. Uh, I think government is responsible from both our scriptures and democratic tradition to protect the poor, fairness in courts and judiciary systems, that's very clear, but, but also to make sure the poor aren't, food stamps is a very archetypal kind of thing the government should do to make sure people aren't, who can't help themselves and enough are being helped. That is very clear from the scriptures in our democratic tradition. However, so the poor food stamps aren't going to solve poverty. So how do, you, how do you move toward the kind of economic growth that's inclusive of everyone? So inequality is 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 only made worse when it's linked with lack of opportunity. Right now, we have less social mobility in America than 
most of Western Europe. The idea of America as the land of opportunity is no longer true. People aren't moving uh, between their, their and, and when there's no opportunity, inequality becomes really a caste system. That's where we are right now. So you can't change that just by government. You've got to change a culture, change an ethos, change a mindset. But uh, government does rules. Um, uh, regulations and rules to make things more fair because our human inclination is always things become less and less fair because of human greed and uh, lack of sensibility. So government has to, you know, protect us from companies throwing stuff in the river or, or uh, uh, I would say uh, taking your, your parents, putting money in for, say, for your college uh, making that part of their speculative investment on, on Wall Street. Those kind of rules can help. But finally, movements, um, civil rights movement, the anti-slavery campaign, women's suffrage, they all come from outside Washington. So while I defend government responsibility on food stamps, uh, like I did all last week, I don't believe change really comes through those structures. Um, it kept four million people out of poverty last year, and they'll be put back in poverty again if that was all cut. But we've got to finally do a sustainable economy that, in fact, is growing uh, in a way that includes those who have been le left out. Now, that's got to be also uh, sensitive to the economies, our ecosystems as well. We'll get to that in a couple of weeks. Uh, but yeah, it's social movements that will change things. And then government has to do its part. But government by itself is not going to be su sufficient. So you've got, you got the, the cons to, caric to caricature, the conservative side on the right, they want to abandon, that literally people would like to cut all food stamps and all the safety nets and just let people uh, take care of themselves. But the liberal side wants to kind of maintain, maintain poverty, if you will, or, or keep people, you know, just kind of maintain, but there's no commitment whatsoever on either side to really overcome poverty. That's what we're lacking, a real political, like Jim Kim is saying, I want to, I want to change extreme poverty. We haven't heard that kind of talk for a long time. We've heard, uh, even from Obama, all middle class talk and not much talk about the poor. So how do we how do we get governments to respond? And King and King got Kennedy and Johnson to respond, but it didn't come from Johnson. Kennedy came from King. So how do you build social movements on the outside? That's why I liked your reflection papers about how could we be part of a movement because that's what it will finally take. Yeah, right next door. Yeah, go ahead. Um, and this is, I guess, going off slightly a personal opinion, yeah. um, but I've always felt that in, in an idealistic world, um, government intervention or aid really wouldn't be necessary because it would all be taken care of by individuals who automatic or just out of their own uh, intuition or just voluntarily give um, to independent philanthropic organizations. And as a result, um, like that government mandate through taxes or SNAP programs um, wouldn't be necessary. Um, of course, that's not the case, um, and government intervention is needed and necessary, and 100% I'm not saying those are not necessary in today's world. Um, but what do you think would be the first step towards changing a culture to where people were more likely to give voluntarily to organizations, um, whether it be World Vision or um, any other philanthropic organization that um, they're sole purpose is to provide for the less fortunate? Well, first of all, you have to unpack what is the people need. And I think government should provide a basic uh, social safety net because there will always be people who are who are need some help. And for example, uh, no matter how much we give in our churches, uh, we can't provide health care for a population of people. There are some things some things only governments can do. Uh, I actually do think that faith-based organizations are often better at delivering some services than governments are sometimes. But we can't, after Katrina, remember we had this 
terrible crisis and government on every level failed, national, state, and city in, in, in New Orleans. And so Lafayette said, well, look at government's failing and look at the fake thing. They're just sending in volunteers. And I preached at a church that sent uh, 46 different teams different weeks to, to, to New Orleans. Amazing. And I would say, that's right, and wonderful work. But governments, I mean, churches can't rebuild levees and can't provide health care for all those people. So what, it, what is, if we all do our share and do it right, that's the partnership. So what can, and government can provide, can't provide all the jobs. Business has to provide jobs. So what can business do? What can government do? What can the civil society do? What can the faith can do? What do we each do? And then how do we work in partnership with, with, with some very clear, bold, common goals? That's what's not happened. So to me, it's not a, uh, a sector debate. It's sort of, um, as you say, changing the culture. And I want to go back to the, to the, when the poverty stats came out last week, showing that things hadn't changed, it, I didn't hear an outcry from the media or the culture about, how can we tolerate this? One in five of our children are poor. How can we tolerate this in the richest country in the world? Um, and it goes back to a lack of relationship. I mean, very few, I'll just say, very few liberal Democrats, not just uh, Democrats, have friends who are poor, have no families who are poor, have dinner with people who have poor children, who are making choices every day that are just foreign to most of us. So it's a lack of relationship and a lack of uh, indignation or toleration of these poverty stats. So that's what I think in your generation may be changing, that I don't want to any longer accept this or tolerate this or live in a world where I have to deny this, ignore this, or blame the victim. must be their fault somehow. So I think it's almost a, a moral or a spiritual change that has to happen first before before the uh, strategic elements get put in place. Yeah, please. Yep, where's the, where's the mic? There you go. Thanks. Um, that's actually a good segue into my question. Uh, I really appreciate how you do recognize that lack of relationships is a huge obstacle mm -hmm. into getting people to care about um, issues in poverty. Right. Um, and so my question is how can we encourage people to kind of push themselves out of their comfort zone. I mean, looking at Washington, D.C. is a great example. It's one of the most socioeconomically and racially segregated areas in the United States, um, especially Georgetown. We live in War II, a predominantly white, very high income community. And then you go east of the Anacostia River. It's majority African-American, um, high concentrations of poverty. I mean, that's a geographical obstacle. How can we just serving as an example, um, but how can we kind of have people bridge the obstacles we create, whether they're geographical segregation or what have you, um, and encourage people to start forming those relationships and restructure society so those relationships are maintained? Mm -hmm. Well, that's that's a conversation we got into a lot last year, and people around the table would say, well, here's what it meant for me until I went uh, – Got involved in this service project, or uh, went for the summer to 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 Haiti or something. That's what opened my eyes. So, so part of it is how can you? Um, I mean, I've gone to schools where um, nobody was doing any service whatsoever, and the response to this kind of talk was completely resistant, uh, defensive, fearful, angry or another school where more than half the student body was involved in service, and was either re required to be or had chosen to be. And the response is entirely different because they actually have seen or heard or touched or tasted or smelled some of what we were talking about. So how does a university uh, like Georgetown really engage the community or give you that platform or how do you find them yourselves? And then your last point though is really critical how do you maintain that perspective how do you how do you not just have a 
a year of service uh, and then go back to normal life or or a summer how, how does it how does it ruin you for life as a JVC uh, uh, when we came, you mentioned D.C., when we came here in 1975 and moved into Mount Pleasant, which was then a very poor, then Columbia Heights, which was a war zone. It's Now it's the hot spot to be on Saturday night. But um, we literally pulled up in trucks, uh, two trucks for two houses, and a bunch of kids were on the sidewalk and said, hey, can we help you move in, help carry your stuff? We said, sure. We want one thing. We want to, we want you got to give us all the old mattresses in the house, in the houses. We said, what? There'll be a lot of mattresses in those houses, and we'd like them. Okay. So we gave them these old, nasty, terrible mattresses in these two houses, dozens of mattresses. And uh, they took the mat- they helped us move in, took the mattresses, and then we, they came down a couple nights later and said, come, down, come on down, I want to show you something. Well, they had strung the mattresses out in the alley, and they were doing acrobatics on the mattresses. And they were doing all these routines on these strong end end mattresses in this alley. And they called themselves the Afrobats, they called themselves. These were kids from the neighborhood, and we got to know them and began to tutor them in school and just get to know them and hang out. And and, uh, they actually became pretty good gymnasts, and they won some tournaments in the city and all that kind of stuff. But one day, they came down and said, um, um, uh, uh, it, was, it was Ronnie who said, we're going to have to move. I said, why? Because um, mom said we got an eviction notice from the city, uh, no, from our landlord, and, and their office was uh, offering us money we have to move. So I went down to talk to Lil, their mom, and she got this letter, and, and it was a landlord gentrifying the neighborhood give them some money, move them out, renovate it, move in wealthier people, Mount Pleasant. And I didn't know a thing about housing, housing law. I said, well, can we look into this? And we did. So we did. And it was an illegal eviction notice, of course. And just just standing next to Lil in a courtroom, two young 20-something young guys, they dropped the charges. right off. They dropped it and walked away, just, just standing there knowing the law was enough to have them let her back in. But then Ronnie came down the next week and said, uh, Teresa went by Isaac's crib and had to pull him out because there was a rat got in the crib. And he got out. Isaac was the baby and Teresa was the older sister. And, uh, and Lil wants to leave now. So we went in literally with <laughs> baseball bats and boots to go after these rats. And I, and I had never seen rats ever like this in my life, big as cats. You walk in the kitchen, they're on the counter, and they don't even run away, they're not even scared. They're kind of saying, come on, you know, they're just, we couldn't get the rats out. So so they moved in with us, this family, moved in with us for uh, for a year, uh, uh, nine kids and mom and dad, in a, in a six bedroom house with one, one bathroom. And we learned a lot about what it means growing up poor in, Washington, D.C., and uh, we'd study the stuff and knew the stuff, but until we lived with a family who had gone through all this, we didn't, we didn't really understand it and didn't have the passion for it because these were not our friends, right? So whatever it takes to get us in the relationship to people who will help us, who will change our worldview, it does change your worldview. You look at things differently now. Or I got called in, the first time Hillary Clinton was called in, she was first lady, just, just arrived, uh, a, a meeting on youth homicide. So I was called in, and about 20 of us in her office in, in the White House. And a uh, good meeting, all this against all the right things and so on. Came home, and there was yellow tape right outside my house, across the street, while we were meeting on the inside. Another kid had gotten shot and killed on my block, just across the street. And for me, going home to yellow tape <laughs> uh, taught me more about the issue than what happened in the, in, in the meeting. And most of us in those me- meetings don't go home to yellow tape. So, so h- how do we put ourselves, how do you, as you're forming your vocations and your careers and lifestyles, how do you put yourself into places we're going to learn what you've got to learn to make a, make a difference on these kind of questions. So, 
that's the, that's the issue. How do we? So it's not you to ask me. It's how to, you know, how you can put yourself in places, positions, situations where you're going to learn those lessons. That's the, that's the question. And do you have kind of any advice about how to encourage others to put themselves out and kind of mobilize people into action? Um, I work with different groups on yeah. campus that do work um, in different areas of DC, and that's yeah. one of kind of our challenges is yeah. encouraging fellow students to realize that they need yeah. to kind of push themselves out I'll of their respond to that, zone. and then we'll break and come back and we'll do the readings. Uh, preaching in that church, I mentioned where they'd gone to New Orleans uh, 46 times. Uh, that doesn't happen unless people are coming home from New Orleans and seeing their neighbors and their church members and their small group members. You won't believe what I saw, what I learned. Um, you got to see this. You got to go. Uh, it's nothing like I've ever seen, experienced before. Or we took in the Contra War when we were fighting the the uh, San Luis in Nicaragua. It was a war against civilians in Nicaragua, and we took. 5,000 North Americans to Nicaragua to the war zones over three years' time. And they saw what was happening, you know. And they came back and they stopped the war. They stopped the funding. 5,000 people in, in the Congress. Because these people were now, now their, their friends, right? So I find that, that when people start doing this, it's so life-changing. It, they're just infectious with this is, you've got to see this. You've got to go and do this. And they they become the recruiters for other people to go and follow in those steps. So we can talk more about that. But I think this is where, see, your generation is much more globalized than any before. And so it's more normal for a lot of you to have been all kinds of places or will be going lots of places. That's what changes us. Uh, and so how do you get outside, the Pope talked about the bubbles, how do we get outside of our bubbles and see and feel and understand life outside our bubbles? That's what changes our perspective on the inside. 